Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first episode of the Non-Aggressive Parenting Podcast I'm here with my co-host, Melissa Rakovich from Washington State. And she's, uh, you can find some of her uh, posting on um, Anarchista Musings and The Voluntary Agrarian. And you can also follow her on Twitter at Mama Anarchist. Um, and so we're going to discuss, this is uh, the very first pilot episode of this uh, new podcast. And we're going to focus a lot about um, peaceful parenting um, I guess attachment parenting, you know, teaching kids how to reason and concepts such as self ownership, property rights, non aggression, you know, really radical, revolutionary type comment. <laughs> revolutionary things uh, that only a crazy anarchist would teach his kids. And, uh, and so this is going to be just, um, you know, a basic episode to get to know where we're coming from, um, an introduction and background, how we both got to. This crazy idea of treating your kids like um, their own, they're their own human beings, <laughs> and uh, and a little fun uh, haircut story that that both of our uh, one of our kids um, experienced. Uh, it's kind of interesting and kind of leads into the idea of self ownership and uh, body integrity and respecting others. So awesome, Melissa! I'm so happy to do this with you. Um, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. I'm excited. It's about time, right? <laughs> I know, right? We've been trying to plan this for a long time, and mm -hmm. uh, things happen, life happens, and we finally got it going, though. So so maybe uh, why don't you go first and uh, just talk about why you think peaceful parenting, um, you know, reasoning with your children, teaching them compassion, teaching them. <laughs> why, why is this even a question, you know? <laughs> you know, why, what, what made you think that these revolutionary concepts are important to teach our kids? <laughs> why do I have to explain this? Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, the, quite the concept. Uh, well, you know, that's the thing is that uh, statism can start at home, you know, and if you teach your children or if you in, assert your authority over them, then they're going to learn that, um, they have to ask for permission that they, everything's ruled around them and that, um, everything that they want to do has to go through some sort of authority figure, you know? And to me, that's just counterintuitive. Like when I watch my children play, I'm not going to dictate everything that they're doing. And I just let them do what they're doing, you know? And, and that allows for their creativity. It allows for them to, uh, just be autonomous and learn their own, um, way of life and do it naturally, you know? And that just makes things a lot easier when you lay off and you just allow your children to be as long as they're not going to harm themselves clearly. But, um, for the most part, you know, I think it's important to teach children that they are autonomous, that they're their own person and that, uh, they are able to make their own decisions, you know, as parents guiding them through that so that, okay, we can do that. Or maybe that's not the best idea to go into the street. Let's try a different route, you know, but, um, I believe if you give your children, um, a lot of respect to their decisions, they become a lot more independent at an earlier age and they're able to rely on themselves and believe in themselves. Yes, yes. And, um, oh, well, let me give you a little bit of my background. Um, actually, before I do that, I just want to say um, that the non aggressive parenting podcast is covered by the BIPCOT No Gov license. This allows for reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So my background, um, I didn't. I wouldn't say I had a, a particularly um, authoritarian or violent background. I mean, there was a little bit of, uh, you know, corporal punishment, just a little. Um, but um, but still, I, I you know grew up um, kind of um, not accepting that, and uh, you know, in high school, being you know an independent person, not willing to stand with the crowd so much, you know. Uh, I, I wanted to isolate myself and uh, and so maybe a little bit of rebellious, but not not as much as others. Um, but yeah, then then before becoming a parent, 
it's kind of interesting. I remember talking with my wife. I remember having a, a conversation with her. And we said, um, I asked her, so if our kid is bad, we're going to spank them, right? And she's like, yeah, why, why not? You know, you were spanked, I was spanked. What's, what's the big deal? <laughs> and so we didn't think anything okay. of it. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't think, yeah, right, you turned out okay. So we didn't think mm-hmm. anything of it. And uh, and then when my son came, um, you know, as a first child, you know, you don't know exactly what to do. You're like reading books and, you know, looking at videos and trying to find out information. How do other people do it? And uh, at first you're like, all right, let me just... Uh, you know, have my parents give me advice because, you know, they raise kids. Um, but then a couple of months later, I um, my, my wife sent me a video from Stefan Molyneux. Uh, I think it's called Seven Reasons Not to Spank Your Children. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that, that started me on my journey of, uh, of Stefan Molyneux and all of his other videos about, you know, uh, voluntarism and anarchy and free markets and economics and all that fun stuff. But, uh, but yeah, he's really big onto the peaceful parenting. And I really, really took it to heart. I really absorbed it. I thought it made sense. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, it's uh, the arguments. The arguments against spanking are just rock solid. You know, the, you you can't Absolutely. you can't really defend it without committing a logical fallacy of one yeah, of one sort or another, right? Uh, right. And so it's um, it's it's very interesting uh, that um, you know, to me it seems it seems like oh, what a coincidence, you know. Um, peace and prosperity occurs when there's less of the state, you know, less regulation, less laws, less taxes, you know, there's more peace and prosperity. Oh, look at that. Children grow up much more healthy and vibrant and robust when they're treated with respect. Huh? Isn't that an interesting coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It just, it's not, it's not hard to follow that, you know, it's, it's, it's right there. Right, right. So, um, so yeah, so that was one thing, and then and then another thing you said was, um, um, I, I it brought to mind how so many people say you know parenting is so exhausting, and one of the reasons that it's exhausting for a lot of people when, when I ask them is because they're like you know I gotta watch my kid, they can't do this, they can't do that, you know you gotta control them every which way, and and um, and you know as a, as as a as someone who strives to, to being a peaceful parent, you know, especially when you have, you have young kids, right? You know, you just make sure they don't get hurt. They don't run in the street. You know, they don't do obvious things like that. But then beyond that, you know, you allow them to explore. You allow them to fall and make mistakes. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's like or, or even, you know, things that most parents would consider unheard of, like like learning how to use a knife or learning right. how to respect fire or, you know, my kids, um, I have them chop vegetables for me when uh when i'm cooking they love to help me make guacamole uh my wife too and uh when she's making like i don't know chili they they, they chop the onions actually my, my daughter loves raw onions yeah, by the way <laughs> interesting <laughs> given her spirit i'm not surprised <laughs> <laughs> i know i know um but yeah so so i thought that was interesting that that people who say that parenting is exhausting are most often the types of people that are so so authoritarian they believe they have to be controlling everything and that is exhausting if you think about it that's very exhausting right yeah absolutely you know and it is you know even for me and maybe because it's i'm a single mom but it it is exhausting still but it's it's got to be um it's i can't imagine if i was putting so much effort into controlling their every move or their every action or, you know, or dictating what's allowed and what's not with whatever they do, which is a lot because, you know, two and four years old, they're constantly into things. They're constantly figuring things out. And if I'm there to, to, to manipulate that all, at all times, I think I wouldn't make it, you know? So, um, it's still tiring, but it's, uh, it's not, it's doable, you know, and it's, it's easier. It's a lot easier, you know? So you know, there's an interesting idea I just thought of that um, when you're out in the, uh, I'll say, I'll say, I mean, when I'm out in the public with my kids, um, other people, or the other adults look at my kids. Sometimes they smile and say, "Oh, it's so cute," uh, because my kids are so um, independent and they just, you know, they they they're very genuine and sincere. They're not afraid of acting a certain way around certain around adults. And so they're, you know, they're basically, they're themselves. They're free to be themselves. Absolutely, Whereas yeah. other kids who are really um, obedient and listen to every single thing their parents say and do not, are careful not to step out of line, it's kind of funny. Those kids don't often get that reaction from those adults. They don't say, oh, that's so cute. Look, your son is so obedient and quiet. Right, right, <laughs> Isn't exactly. That so we, we, they appreciate the independence and individuality of free 
children. <laughs> right. Well, and, and to me, you, you see like those children, they, they exhibit a stronger spirit. They're more uh, sure of themselves. Like my children will go up and walk right up to other kids and play. And I, I, I notice other children sometimes will be like, look at their parents. Like, is it okay if I play with this little kid? Like, you know, and I just, yeah, go, go. You want to go <laughs> invite her to go play, do it, go for it. You know, and I don't even, you know, and you know, and I encourage it. Um, you know, or my kids, you know, they, they'll, they'll run around and they'll fall and I don't even notice it. And my kids, kids get right back up and they run around and I have had parents come up to me and they're like, I can't believe your kids didn't make a sound. Like, I can't believe <laughs> I they weren't that. freaking out. And I'm like, it's cause I let my kids fall. So they know how to get back up, you know? Right. And, you know, I mean, of course, like if they, I don't let them fall from two stories, you know, right. or, <laughs> um, and, and if they're literally, if they are crying and they need my help, I'm right there. But for the most part, I just wait to see what the reaction is. And then I move accordingly, you know, and, um, and that's given them a lot of, um, confidence in themselves as well. And I get that too. When I take my kids out and about people are just, they're amazed at how, uh, my kids are very, they're able to carry on a conversation with adults. Mm. Um, and it, almost as if they're equals, you know, like they'll, they'll just have a full on conversation with them and people always compliment me on that. And, you know, and I'm like, well, it's cause that's how I talk to them. You know, I don't talk down at them. I don't use baby words. Never did. Like I've always talked to them as if, um, they were another person I respect because I do. Um, I don't pull the mom card, <laughs> you know, like mm. I, I try to just uh, like keep them safe. That's my goal. And also guide them through life and show them, well, this is how I live. This is this is what I do, and it, and if you want people to respond to you or respect you, you got to give respect back, and and that sort of thing, and and you know for the most part they pick that up intuitively, like they know that, you know they know to treat people nicely. They, I don't have to tell them, well you have to be nice. Like they know that, they know the response that that gets, especially when they fight between the two of them. You know, like they know it works if they're nice to each other versus when they're fighting. You know, so yeah, I feel like when when parents use the card of. Um you know, the, the mom card or the dad card, like, you know, you, you know, listen to me. And they say, why? Because I'm your mother. I, I feel like that's a, that's a cop out. That's basically, it, it's basically saying I've run out of, I've run out of reasons and I can't, I can't give you another reason. So I'm just going to do the authority, uh, reason. Um, and that's so sad, you know, it's really sad when, when parents do that. And, um, I, I, um, I don't know if I do that at all. I'm, I mean, I try really hard not to. And, and also another thing is I, I, I like to explain as much as possible, explain why you want them to do something or why not, not to do something. Right. Right. And, um, you know, even if you don't think that they'll understand your explanation, still explain it to them because how do you think Absolutely. they're going to understand your explanations if you're not explaining things to them? <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, and then you don't, you don't want to teach them that just because someone said so you go along with it. I mean, that's right. the problem with statism, right? right? Like the ultimate, because I said so, is the state you know what I mean and that's something my mom used to do all the time I would ask her something and she'd say well because I said so <laughs> end of conversation you don't get to ask any more questions and I remember being frustrated because it didn't make any sense to me like well but then who are you like why do you get to say so you know <laughs> um and I, you know, and yeah, kids, they're constantly learning. They're sponges. They're constantly picking things up. They're, they're trying to figure out the world. And that's your role. Your role is to explain it. Your role is to guide them and show them, you know, so, <laughs> you know, to say I said so, or, or, um, because I'm the mom or it is a cop out, you know, and, and it, it's, and that's disrespectful to me. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing I try to do a lot is, um, if I'm in the wrong, you know, I, I try to apologize to them and, you know, say sorry. I think that's another thing that a lot of parents don't do as often because they don't want to seem imperfect or fallible to their kids. You know, they want to right. seem like they're, they know it all. They got it together, you know. And, um, you know, basically I, I hear them say, you know, as a parent, you have to appear like the, the strong pillar, you know, right. you, you can't appear imperfect or weak because then your child is going to be insecure because they need to rely on you for everything. But they see that you're weak or that you're talking to them or explaining things to them like they're an equal and, you, and you're not an equal. You're you're right. you're an adult. Right. Uh, um, so. So, yeah. So I um, I don't like that. <laughs> of course not. That's not my that's not my style at all. I talk to them as much as possible and I say sorry when I've done something that uh or, or when i've been corrected maybe um Absolutely. and so i think that's very important very empowering um and that's not showing weakness i think it's showing character strength 
<laughs> Absolutely. I do that with my children too. You know, like, you know what, I'm sorry, you know, like I'll apologize and I'll talk them through it and explain it. And, um, you know, and, and, or, you know, and, and doing that, what that does is show that no one's perfect. Nobody's perfect, you know, and, and they need to know that and they need to know that people make mistakes and also that it's important to own up to your mistakes, you know, and that's, and also <laughs> the only way you're going to do anything really with your children is lead by example. You know, you, you can't tell them to do something and then do the opposite. They, they watch your actions more than anything. They pick up on actions more than anything. Your words are meaningless if you don't have the actions to back it up, which comes back to having principles and living by your principles, which is, um, the whole reason for raising our children this way. We wouldn't want someone else treating us this way. We don't treat other people this way. Our children are no different. They're humans too. So we're going to give them the same respect. So yeah, I often apologize because mom makes mistakes all the time. Yeah. So yeah. So on the topic of, uh, perceived mistakes and, um, in or, or imperfections uh, <laughs> so we have these haircut stories so we do. Uh, actually you know what we should mention the, the ages of our kids so my my son is six and my daughter's four um but don't don't let the ages fool you she's in control <laughs> of that relationship <laughs> so right so so why, why don't you start off with the haircut stories and, and the ages <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so my son is two and a half and my daughter's about four and a half. And actually I think our daughters are about a week apart in age. Nice. Um, which is funny cause I was thinking about that with the haircut stories, you yeah. know, cause you told me about your haircut story and a few weeks later, sure enough, my daughter does it. So, <laughs> um, I think it was yesterday. Talk about letting your kids use sharp objects. I let my daughter use scissors, you know, cause she knows how to use them. And, um, I've instructed her on how to keep safe with them. And she's just in the other room cutting up construction paper, working in crafts. And all of a sudden, and it's so funny, my daughter, she, um, she walks by my bedroom and I'm studying and I'm, I'm getting stuff done. And, um, while my son is sleeping and she's like, mom, what do you think? And she had this look <laughs> on her face and I look and I couldn't tell because she has these long, beautiful, curly golden locks, but then she cut like just the first initial parts of it. Uh -huh. And my first thought was, oh, here we go. Okay. What am I going to do? I just talked about this with Danilo. I don't have an issue with that. Why sh I shouldn't be freaking out about this. No, I'm not going to freak out about this. This is actually good. This is a, uh -huh. a step for her deciding what she wants in her life and taking action to do it. And she didn't ask anybody. So I called her in to my room and I'm like, Ro, I really like that. Do you, do you like your haircut? Did you want to cut your hair? Like, she's like, yeah, I want my hair short. And I said, okay, do you want me to continue doing it? Cause I can get the whole thing, you know, and I know how to cut hair. So I was like, oh, you want to okay. sit down in my room and I can, you know, get your, your, do a full on haircut. And she was so excited, so excited. Like, wow. you know, that it's like a, it was, it was a really sweet bonding moment, you know? And I was sitting there cutting her hair and this is her first haircut. So I, and so she's had these really, this really long hair and I was so excited because it was like, it was amazing. It was amazing to see this little child just go, you know what, I'm going to change something about my life and I'm going to do it. And then I saw an opportunity to respect her for that and not admonish her and not uh, embarrass her over it. Uh, Cause that's something my parents would have done. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I, that didn't make sense to me. I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to cut my hair and I did, it was a bad situation. You know, my parents were upset that I, you know, and I, and I remember thinking, but it's my hair. Like, why can't I cut my hair? Mm, so right. anyhow, um, we cut her hair and she loves it and she's so excited and she, and she keeps asking, and it's, that was a couple days ago, I think two or three days ago. And she's like, has it grown back yet? Mom, can we do another haircut? And I'm like, <laughs> well, it will grow back, but it takes a little time. And, and so, um, but yeah, I mean, she's been, and she goes around and she tells people too, she went to the park yesterday and she's like, I cut my hair, you know, and, um, and, and, um, she's just proud. She's very proud of that decision. And, and it, and I remember too thinking to Nilo as I was cutting her hair, that how wonderful of an opportunity to respect her in the situation. And it's not exhausting. Had I gotten upset, had I wanted to discipline her, had, you know, all those things that my parents would have done, um, it would have been exhausting and emotionally draining. And it would have, it would have caused some damage for her in my, it, you know, it, and it would have probably made her second guess the fact that she could make decisions, you know, that's my thinking. So, and then I thought of your story. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's an amazing story. Um, so before I tell you about my kids, I just thought of something. I have a friend who has a five-year-old boy, and he, this boy is um, 
he's pretty sensitive to to touch. Like she says, she has a very hard time cutting his nails, washing him in the bathtub, soap, shampoo, all that. Very very difficult. He just doesn't like to be touched. He's right. very particular about that. And um, and so hair also was very touchy for him, very sensitive, and and so his hair became very long because. She didn't want to force him. You know, she, she's kind of like us. Well, she's not an anarchist, but she's like us in that she understands how important it is to respect your children and their decisions and what they want with their own body. And so she's like, all right. And so he grew his hair like um, around shoulder length, maybe a little bit past. And um, her family did not like it. Like her aunts, uncles, her father, her grandmother, they didn't like it. Everyone's like encouraging it. But she's like, that's what he likes and we're going to keep it. And, and then one day um, her husband... I don't know what possessed him, but he cut he cut his son's hair. Very, I, I think, I don't know if it was the shaver or something, but he really short, and his son was like crying, crying. I don't know. Maybe his son didn't know what was happening. I don't know, but it was like traumatizing, very emotionally mm. traumatizing. And yeah. and she was like, "Why did you do that?" And he's like, "I know. I thought it would be fine. You just took a shower and everything." And so it, you know, and so he, again, he let it grow really long, but then eventually, you know, she she would just bring it up occasionally. It's like, you sure you don't want to cut your hair? And he would say no. And then she would try again, you know, a couple months later. And then one time, she he's like, and she asked him again, and he's like, yeah, I want to cut my hair. <laughs> so right. he cut it really short, but this time, no trauma, right? Uh, because right. he accepted it and he wanted it, and I thought that was a beautiful thing. And so, so yeah, it's it's, it's just a wonderful thing when you um. You know, when you really acknowledge your child's autonomy and self ownership, um, and it's it's yeah, it's really beautiful. So, so my daughter, um, who was like around December nine this year, um, when uh, it was a birthday party and we were all downstairs, and then and then uh, my daughter kind of disappeared. And yeah, my sister, my daughter uses a uh, um, scissors. Also, they you know like 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 your daughter doing different crafts and everything. So they're pretty competent with scissors. So uh, she found. Oh yeah, my, my my wife bought this special scissors though for cutting hair. That's right. So she 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 got that and she went upstairs and she got a stool because <laughs> she can't she can't <laughs> even see over the counter herself. She got a right. stool and and she proceeded to cut her hair. Nobody was there. And then uh, my mother found her first. She went upstairs and she was like, I think she was like angry, and in shock. And no, what are you doing? You know, and she saw that uh, you know she found it with like a a big chunk of hair in her hand, and then there's also a lot of hair in the garbage. But she was going, she was going at it. She was enjoying herself, <laughs> just cutting, cutting, cutting. Um, and it's just an amazing thing that the kids, um, they don't feel the same kind of, I guess, um, social pressures that a lot of um, adults would feel. You know, just like right. cutting your hair yourself. You're like, oh no, what if I do a bad job? What if it's not even? What if <laughs> they're not even thinking about <laughs> they that? They don't care right. about that. And uh, and so yeah, so she came down and. Uh, and we all, you know, nobody was really yelling at her, but I could sense I and I could see that my family members, they were not happy. They're like, um, that's nice, but you're not going to do it again, are you? <laughs> you know, and then and then my and then my wife's mother, she said kind of similar thing, but so she wasn't really happy. But my wife, she eventually, you know, um, yeah, my uh, my daughter, Serena, she allowed her my wife to shape it up, make it look nice. So it, does, it does look nice now. Um, but um but yes, yeah, similar sort of thing. You know, I was proud of her. I was saying, you know, I'm just happy that she made a decision on her own. And, uh, and yeah. I'm, just, I'm just proud that they can take um, matters into their own hands. And, and you know what? Like your daughter um, asked that question, like, you know, did it grow back yet? So so that's a lesson. They're learning, right. they're learning about their body, how fast your exactly. hair grows, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. How, how, how permanent such a decision is. Right, right, right. exactly, exactly. So, um, so yeah, so self-ownership is, um, is something that, you know, I guess we don't really learn as a concept, you know, as a child and then later as a volunteer, <laughs> not because we learned that, but, um, I think as, as peaceful parents, that's what we're trying to teach our kids, right? What is self-ownership? Um, even before they know that phrase, you know, I, I want them to be firmly, firmly understanding of that concept, Right. right. Yeah. Well, actually, when uh, my daughter, she was about two years old when my son was born. And I remember thinking, OK, there's going to come a time when they do the sibling thing and they are invading each other's space or, you know, wanting to manipulate each other or fight, you know. And um, I remember thinking, like, you know, when you're little, you're taught that you should um, no, you can't touch them. No, don't do this. Don't do that. And I, and I kept thinking, you know, there's got to be a way to integrate 
my principles as an anarchist mm. using self ownership, what better way to teach children about self ownership than okay, personal space? You know, what does that look like? And so from from the time that they, my daughter was two and my son was a newborn, I talked about self ownership and I explained it in a way where it's like, you know, if my daughter is trying to manipulate my son, like here, come over here, I want you to do this, and he's not happy with that, and like, whoa, let's wait a minute this doesn't work. You're violating his self ownership. He's not happy with that. And you know, you, he's autonomous, you're autonomous. You guys have your own self ownership. You, you know, you can, you can protect that. You're responsible for that. And, and so it's funny, like they, they, they've already get, they're already getting the voluntary lingo, you know, mm -hmm. like lingo, like they, you know, and of course they would, you know, and, um, my daughter would start calling it. Um, I remember one time uh, my ex and was uh, in the bathroom with her while she was washing her hands and he was standing too close to the sink for her comfort or something. And she goes, dad, can I get some self owner space over here? You know, like she was like, you need to go away, you know? And then, um, uh, or she'll, she'll say, she'll yell at her brother and say, Keenan, I want my space ownership, you know, like, <laughs> so, and then, um, the other day, it was a couple weeks ago, uh, my son, he hasn't really said those words yet, but we were, they were in the car and, you know, they were fighting and he's touching me, she's touching me. And <laughs> my son all out of the blue goes, bro, ownership. And like, and she stopped, like she knew, but like, that was wow. the first time he ever said that. And wow. it was like, I was so proud. Like, <laughs> great. Yes. Grow up with that. Like that's, you know, that's something you should know. And so, uh, yeah, I introduced it to my kids early on as a way to explain, you know, personal space and, you know, and, and you know, as they get older and as we, as uh, a voluntary is trying to create a world where, um, people are aware what self-ownership is or are aware of what anarchist principles are, they, they will step into a world that we're creating and it won't be new to them, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Oh yeah, they're going to be the ones to yeah to definitely um, be the bricks, you know, to to create this new world, and it's going to be beautiful. I think it's going to be beautiful. Um, you know, one thing that you you made me realize was um, how important it is to um, clearly um, say the words that you mean and not and not talk down to them as children, right? right? Absolutely. And uh, actually, I I should do that. I haven't done that with them. I haven't said those words self ownership, but I think I'm going to start. I like that idea. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how much do you use it in conversations or your podcasts or, you right, know, right. like when you're talking to other people or other adults, you know, and I don't know, I, I like that. I like the idea that they learn about um, voluntarism at a very young age, you know, because this is what mama does. This is her principles and this, you know, don't do, don't do others harm and don't take their stuff, you know, and self-defense is a thing. And, but, you know, and, and so, I don't know, to me, it's like if you explain it to them at a very young age, and even if they don't get it, like we were discussing, you just keep talking about it, keep talking about it, and it'll become second nature for them. It'll become a thing where they go, okay, yeah, this this makes sense for me, and, and then they start to implement it in their own lives. So, I would have loved if I had grown up with the concept of self-ownership. <laughs> I know, I know. A lot of us... Uh... Yeah, that's not that's not the first thing in a in a I guess a, t a typical traditional family environment. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's more like uh, you know this is this is the rules of the house and you're gonna obey me, you know stuff like that. Right. Crap like that, but um, but yeah, I mean as as uh, as volunteers and anarchists, we really I think are um, raising a different sort of human being, mm -hmm. and it's a challenge and it's not easy. It's um, you know, talk about exhaustive parenting. Um, I think that's that's one of the most difficult things to do is to raise a child, an independent, free-thinking child, because um, they're not just going to listen to you. They're going to want an explanation um, for everything, which is good. You know, it, it can get tiring after a while. You know, you ask a question, why, why? And you got to explain. But, but you know, the more you, <laughs> do, you dedicate yourself and you devote yourself to that, um, it's an investment, an investment for it the is, future. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one thing too, like my, I don't have all the answers and right. nobody does, you know, right. and my daughter will ask me questions. Why this, why that will, you know, and, and sometimes I'll get to a point where we're like, you know what, Ro, I don't know the answer to that. You know, like we can go look it up or we can ask somebody else, but I don't know. And she'll get frustrated at me and she'll say, no, <laughs> really? mom, you do know, you know everything. I'm like, whoa, now, no, no, I don't know everything. I said, kid, I'm learning this whole journey too. Like I'm right there with you. Like this is, you know, I'm I've only been here 36 years, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to figure it out right now, you know? So, yeah. um, but I, I, I like to teach them that I don't have all the answers, you know, that, um, nobody, know nobody does, you know? And so, and that's important too, for them to, um, if they're asking, 
one, that they learn to explore other resources for information, but then also that people there's, they can't, they can't rely on someone to know all the answers or give them all the information. Mm, so right. it, it teaches them to uh, think about that a little bit more, which I think is valuable. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a really good point that, um, you know, that's, that's one thing that I hear Larkin Rose say a lot, which is, um, you know, people think that when they place their trust in, the, in an authority figure, let's say God or the Bible or the state or whatever, um, they, 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 they think that, you know, you can just trust everything that, that, whatever God says, whatever the Bible says I'm going to do. But no, actually, that's not that's not the case because right. you had to make that decision to trust. <laughs> so you're yeah. actually, you are making a decision. You're not handing everything over. You're the one that's making the decision, but the decision you're making is to obey everything, <laughs> which is a kind of stupid right. decision. <laughs> right. And, and that's where you get the order followers, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um and and you know another topic that's kind of related to this the self ownership is um circumcision um mm. and and also ear piercing for for girls, right. right? And you know my my family uh thankfully did not circumcise us and understood how um inhumane that would have been. Um but um yeah, but but for some reason ear piercings maybe it's not as severe as circumcision, um, but still, I, I, I would make the argument that is a violation of, of self ownership, even though it's Absolutely. not it's not it's not really permanent. Like you take you know take the earrings out, it grows back, right? But um, but yeah, so it, it's just sad, you know, when you see like infants in like you know those those earring shops, you know, just crying and crying and crying, and they do that gun. And, oh man! <laughs> well, and for what? You know, it's for it's for you or it's for the parent. It's not for the kid. The baby right, doesn't want earrings. Exactly. The baby asks for earrings. I don't think so. Like, <laughs> exactly. You know, and so you're putting them through this process where, you know, so, yeah, I've never understood that either. And it is heartbreaking because I have seen that. Like, you know, I've witnessed that, like, you know, walking by and, and I'm like, and I always remember thinking, like, why would you put your kid through that? It's unnecessary. Mm. And it is, you know, I can't imagine, especially at infants, it, something like that, even though it's just your ears pierced, um, it's gotta be a lot of pain. And for them, you know, what's their scale of pain? They don't really know. And then also they're there with their trusted care provider and they just, they have to sit through it. Right. Like their, mm. their, their parent is right there holding them as that's happening. Right. And, you know, and you know, so I don't know, I think that could be very traumatizing. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so what are your views and, and your, that of your family about on circumcision? Um, you know, <laughs> I didn't circumcise my son. I was very much against it. Um, I actually, it took about six months to convince my ex, um, that we weren't going to circumcise our son. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was through research and, um, I used to teach childbirth education. So I actually would do like, uh, probably, you know, I, I would do like, uh, about, you know, four weeks of childbirth education. And one of the nights I would take like maybe an hour or two and talk, go through circumcision and what, what the process is and, you know, the benefits or, you know, versus the risks and that sort of thing. So I had a lot of information. Um, but funny enough, you know, my ex was like, yeah, I don't know. You're telling me all this, but you know, I'd like more information. So I actually connected with another guy who they, who he's called a, an inactivist. Is that the in intactivist intactivist? That's right. it. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, who was Serbian, who was my ex is Serbian. So, ah. um, they bonded and um, he like, and it, sure enough, this guy sent my ex all the videos, mm. all the links, everything that I showed my ex already, uh. this guy did. And, and, but I think my ex needed to hear it from a different perspective. Um, and so, yeah, so we didn't circumcise. And then, um, you know, my parents didn't say much family didn't say much. I, you know, as with my whole life, they've always been like, what is she up to? What's going on? Okay, just don't ask. Just <laughs> let her do her thing. Don't you know. Her. Um, and so, but yeah, when it comes to when it comes to um, like things like that, uh, my parents don't ask too much. Uh, my mom would get upset uh, if I did something different than she chose to do, and um, you know, and she and, and I think she saw that as a failure on her part, right? Like, so, well, why didn't you circumcise your son? Because I circumcised your brother, and I'm like well, mom, here's the research. This is the reason why we chose not to, and it's unnecessary and it's his body. And she got upset about that, you know? And so she actually stopped asking me questions about why I'm raising my kids because it's, it's a complete 180 from the mm. way I was raised. Mm. Um, and, and it's not, an in, I'm not an 
insulting her, but I'm just letting her know like why well, I came to this because I educated myself, you know, and I, and I, and, and I went through and I made the decision. And especially since I, I, um, I see my child, you know, as another human, he's not just my kid. Like he's somebody that is, uh, should be respected. And if he ever wants to do anything to alter his body, that's on him. Mm. He can make that decision. Mm. I'm not going to do that for him. Cause who am I? You know, I, 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 I don't have the right to do that. So, yeah. Um, so my parents were confused, but, um, <laughs> and then they understood it, but I think they went back into denial because I don't think they wanted to admit to the mistakes that they made, you know? So, yeah, the idea that, um, you know, we should, um, you know, call out our parents and, you know, say, you know, you, you did this to me and why, right. and, you know, you made a mistake. Um, I could see why some people would want to do that as a form of purging and expressing yourself and all that and, and on, the, on the path to healing. But after that, I think it can be counterproductive and harmful to continue Absolutely. continue blaming your parents for you know the way you came out. Um, because, it, it, you know, in one sense, they were doing what they thought was best uh, right. with the knowledge they had at the time. Um and I, and I, I mean, I don't think any parents are malicious, like intentionally, like I want to make my child's life worse. Like who right. thinks like that? Nobody thinks like that, right? So most most parents, I think, genuinely want to help their kid and they think that doing whatever, give, saying them to, to, I don't know, public school, sending them to, you know, um, I don't know, um, yeah, circumcising, do, you know, spanking, you know, punishment, whatever. They think all that is, is good to produce um, a, a healthy functioning human being and um and a lot of to that produce a citizen to produce a citizen yeah and all mm -hmm. and we're saying no <laughs> you know we're saying right. the complete opposite so um yeah it can be shocking but um but yeah so so i i um you know i've come to terms and you know we, the blame uh the blame game gets old and it gets you know harmful to yourself and it's just like it's kind of like um you know blaming other people for the way you are is kind of like wishing another person would die and you drink the poison right? absolutely <laughs> you know? i was just thinking of that quote yeah absolutely. oh you were okay <laughs> yeah that. yeah uh-huh <laughs> um and uh and, and also i i remembered that there's a, a documentary called american circumcision that is going to come out next uh oh this year yeah i think um maybe in the summertime and uh steph Amon, you interviewed the uh the filmmaker for that and um, and I contacted the guy after I heard that interview, and I said like I want to get you on, and so he's he said yes, but you know he wants to do it closer to the date, so we're gonna see. Sure, but oh, I'm, that's excited. Awesome. I'm excited. That's awesome. I'm, I'm excited to, to um, see that documentary too. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, yes, yeah, so there's just trailer, you know, a trailer and a couple of short videos on YouTube, but uh, but yeah, I'm so I'm so happy that that now there um, a lot of more people are coming out and uh, making documentaries and just more information coming out because it's such a barbaric practice. Like so many things that, um, that we as volunteers are exposing and just revealing that, you know, we don't have to continue doing things the way we've been doing it because um, that's not a good enough reason. That's <laughs> one of the worst right. reasons. Absolutely. Well, and that's one thing that um, when I my son's pediatrician, I had talked to her about it. Um, she said that she's she's seen a decline in the rate of circumcision because um, just in the last I want to say 10 years is what her and I were discussing. And she was saying, like, people really don't do it's not a go to thing as much as it was like, you know, back when, you know, we were kids and born like that was just what you did. You just you know, you just went and had your son circumcised and you didn't think about it. But now more and more people, there's a lot more information out there websites, um, videos, uh, the intactivists, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a movement to educate and there's a movement, um, that, um, that really wants to change that barbaric practice, you know? And, and so I, I, I've talking to the pediatrician, she's noticed quite a bit, quite a decline, you know, in, in that, um, in that, and, um, and a lot of it too, what I've noticed is that, uh, what she had said is that, um, it, it costs extra, it costs a lot extra insurance, insurance has stopped covering it for the most part, or at mm -hmm. least in Washington state. Um, and she was saying that, you know, they, people, and so uh, sometimes parents will make the decision just cause it's going to cost too much money, which, okay, <laughs> as long as you just didn't hurt your kid, if that's the reason, then fine. But you know, I mean, there's various reasons as to the decline of circumcision. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I would say the, one of the biggest reasons is, um, the um the rise of the digital age right the, mm -hmm. the the internet and it's kind of interesting that so many people that i meet 
Actually, a lot of people that I hang out with, um, my homeschooling group, um, they are very critical of social media and the internet in general. We were talking about this recently at a conversation, and they were saying how you know it's a bad thing, especially social media, I guess, because it it separates people, it makes people distant. It, um, yeah, I guess I don't know. Maybe the electronic stuff is bad for the brain, all that kind of stuff. But I, I think that it's just like you know Gutenberg's press, right? When right. you can mass produce information. How can that be a bad thing? <laughs> you know, you, do you want less options or more options? Which one do you right. want? You want basically right. socialism or you want free market capitalism? Right, right. Well, and then how many people do you connect with online? Like you and I, we haven't Ex- met in person. Exactly. But how long have we been talking? And how, exactly. long, how, many, how many times a week are we talking on Telegram and <laughs> having conversations and talking about what's going on with our children? And, and we've formed this friendship that's totally invaluable and it's, and it's amazing. And then, oh, what do you know? Here's an idea for a podcast, you know? Um, <laughs> but there's, it's like anything, it's a tool, you know, it can be good. It can be used for good or used for bad, you know? And, 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 um, people's perception of it, you know, um, yeah, a lot of screen time for your kids and that sort of thing, or screen time for adults. And, you know, there's arguments to be made on both sides of it, but, um, you know, and especially with the voluntarist and anarchist community, it's been amazing. I mean, the, right. the, the problem, the problem, my friend, Mandy Silver, she, I remember her saying once the problem with anarchists is distance. You know, a lot of us are like mm. on Facebook and we've, and we've met and we talk and we interact and then, but we're all over the place. We're all over the world. We're we're across the country, and and yet we're able to build communities online and discuss things and and like minded um, theories and ideas, and then also encourage one another with podcasts, with projects, with promoting it. You know, and so yeah. Anyway, to hijack what you were saying, I think it's a I think it's an incredible thing. You know, the the age of information and the internet, and you know what we're able to accomplish. So. Yeah, it's like it's like you know people. It's it's so weird. It's like these people. Th- their argument to me sounds like I would rather wash my clothes by hand <laughs> than put it in a washing machine. <laughs> right. That's what it sounds like to me when they say they hate the internet. You know right. why? What's wrong with you? <laughs> my God. Right. It's like how many how many things have you learned online? How many communities have you joined? How many like like you said? How many people have you met? online that you've never met in person that you develop good long-lasting friendships it's an amazing thing it's uniting the world and i think the very fact that um, people love social media is testament to the idea that people want to connect we don't want to disconnect (laughs) we want to connect with each other that's that's the reason that social media is loved by so many people you know absolutely absolutely yeah um but uh but yeah i guess um you know to bring it around to children um let's say the idea of screen time right with kids um this is in another interesting topic um i have we we have an ipad what is it two and um we got my smartphone an iphone and then uh, my wife has a little ipod um but there the ipad is really theirs and so you know in the morning they wake up and they watch a couple of videos they play some games then we leave we go out for the day and uh and then we come back at night it's it's like their way to calm down relax decompress and mm-hmm. um you know i don't i wouldn't say i i don't impose limits on them um my wife maybe a little bit more but um but i i think they do self regulate in the mm-hmm. sense that if you let them you know people say well if you're going to let them watch you going to watch all day no it doesn't really happen no, like they that get bored. <laughs> they, they want to go do something else you know after after a little while i've noticed Right, right, and and also, um, um, I don't know if this is like this is representative of of the entire gender. <laughs> Probably not. But my <laughs> daughter does not like watching the iPad much at all. Like she watch a little bit, she'll get her fill, and then she's off to doing something else. Like please, like play dress up, and she puts on sure. her gowns and her ballet and her different outfits, and she plays by herself. But my son, he really loves the um, he really loves the iPad, especially games. He's really good at games. It's amazing. I I, I see in his future like some kind of game developer like right. like he's awesome and these games are really hard um yeah. and he's just awesome so i don't know if that's a that's a male and female thing because i don't know if you've seen this this is one video um that um julia taransky made on her channel brave the world um it's a 30 minute video called 
50 things that um, are different between men and women. Right. <laughs> I, I don't no, know. I didn't see that. No. Oh, that's such an awesome one. Basically tearing apart all, all these feminists. Mm -hmm. I have mentioned it? Okay. Yeah, because uh, I think it was our discussion about feminism. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah, favorite so, subject. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's just amazing how, um, you know, she was saying how, you know, boys tend to be attracted more towards fast moving objects, um, you know, more aggressive, you know, slightly more aggressive play. Um, and girls tend to be more attracted to dolls and faces and warm colors and hugging and sharing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that would make sense too, because you think back to like hunter gatherers, you right. know, and 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 what you know, what biologically, you know, like <laughs> way back when, when a woman had a baby, you know, she was home in the cave or whatever with the right. baby, right, and, right. and and being around, you know, and and nurturing and caring and all that, and then the man went out and he was hunting, you right. know, and so of course your little boy is like interested in that um, right. <laughs> fast moving stuff, right? right. Like there's that, that hunter mentality and, you know, and I see that with, I was thinking about that today with my kids. Like my daughter loves to be a little mom, you know, she likes to um, play with her dolls and my son loves his cars. Oh my gosh. He's such a boy. Like he loves his cars and his trucks and he's like so aggressive. But then my son will turn around and go get his baby doll. Cause he's got one and he wants, to wear, <laughs> he wants to wear the baby. Like, cause, ah. cause, cause I always wore them as babies. Ah, and so, okay. <laughs> um, and so he likes to wear baby dolls and then my daughter will get the blocks out and she's like building these crazy towers. And mm -hmm. like, I'm like, maybe she'll be in architecture <laughs> or get into architecture or something like that's interesting. And, um, and you know, and it's interesting, like they have these ideas that they, 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 they naturally gravitate toward like you know, um, play things that uh, to me seems natural to their gender, but then sometimes they'll switch it up and then they'll go back to it. But yeah, for the most part, like my daughter loves to dress up. Like, in mm. fact, we need to get our kids together. <laughs> no, right? we get along. Um, but my daughter loves dress up and dance. And, um, and my son is more into like, also like the fast moving things. Oh my gosh. And that kid, he loves trains. He's obsessed with trains, mm. you know? And, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. And, and, um, so the, the the feminist um idea that you know first of all that men and women are equal which is completely <laughs> idiotic like biologically like come on <laughs> and then um and what was the other thing like um i don't know it's it just seems like they just despise oh yeah the other thing is that the reason that girls like dolls is because they're programmed to by society. Like, I don't know, the TV, commercials, billboards. That's why they like dolls, right? And and, right. and the same thing for, for boys they, is what feminists say. The reason, the only reason they like cars and trucks and, and fighting figures is because they're programmed by society, by all these um, mediums to like those things. And and so in this, in this video, Julia Taransky made a, um, she quoted a study of infant, I think it was chimpanzees, and, uh, you know, there was a male and a female infant and they gave, uh, you know, cars and a doll to the uh, to the female and the female took the doll. Right. <laughs> and then the same thing with the male, both of them. And he took the he took the trains and the trucks and the cars. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> exactly. <that> <laughs> right. It's not surprising. Doesn't surprise me at all. So, I, I mean, yeah, so it's just it's just um it's just uh it's yeah it's an amazing thing how deeply ingrained some of these attributes are and um and, and another thing you know you know how like how i i look at my son i say oh he might be a game developer you, you look at your um your daughter and you're like oh she might be an architect and that's a nice thing to imagine but um you know they're like well if she wants to do that she can do that you know if that makes her happy but if not that's fine too you know right. and i think that's something that parents um have to embrace also it's like once they get to the college age um, you know, so it's usually the parents dictating, all right, this is going to make money. This is going to make money. This is not going to make money. <laughs> right. Conform well, and that's if they go to college, like, you know, yeah, I, good point. if my kid yeah. wants to go to college, go for it. Right. Uh, honestly, I, I would encourage trade schools more right. than college, exactly. you know, um, but it's, it's going to be up to them. And, uh, but I'm definitely not going to push for it. You know, that's something that like, it seems like so many kids, they just like, you get funneled from public school straight into another public school, essentially, you know, like college is, um, very much, um, a prop by the government, you know, and I'm, I'm going through school right now. I'm, I'm working on my degree so I can transfer to acupuncture school. Um, and the stuff that I read, but these textbooks by the, by the government, I'm like, this is the stuff I remember reading about 
when before I dropped out of school, you know, mm-hmm. in, in public school, like the stuff that they teach, it's not really that they're teaching anything. And you go through it, and you get this piece of paper. And I know some degrees can be valuable. But, you know, for the most part, all these kids are going to school because that's what they're supposed to do, right? Because you're told that you can't um, do anything unless you have a college degree, which is absolutely ridiculous. You know, I'm 36 years old, just now getting my associate's degree. I've had a very successful career as a a uh, doula and massage therapist and a childbirth educator, um, and want to be midwife, you know? Um, so, you know, I mean, that's the thing is I, I, I really, um, as my kids get older and I, I, what I love about my children, watching them grow Danilo is watching them become their own person. Like it's just amazing to see these personalities develop. You know, I can't imagine, thinking, well, I hope you do this one day. Like, I, I hope you, um, go down this career path or I hope you do this. And, and, and I, I can't wait to see what they do with their lives, you know, especially when they grow up empowered, you know, to make their own decisions and would they grow up to be creative and, and to express their creativity. And, um, so anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. We are uh, not central planning parents at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. um, and you know, yeah, that's one thing that people ask me as a uh, as a homeschooling parent is that, um, w- what what about college? What are they going to do? And uh, and like you said, maybe there won't even won't even be college at that time. Like like how fast how fast are things changing and transforming right now? And right. and institutions being rendered obsolete, and right. and colleges and universities to me really signify um, a barbaric relic of the past. Um, you know, you got to go to a big building with books and write stuff or maybe bring your laptop and type whatever the guy is saying. And yet what, how much information is available online? <laughs> Why well, I- and how much money are, you know, people are going into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to yeah. get a degree, you oh, know, which oh, yeah. that's a house, you know, know or something right. like what? <laughs> Yeah, that's the other thing, and which again probably leads me to believe that you know if if it wasn't for those federal funds, would they even exist? You know, does it maybe maybe they're what what the federal government thinks of as too big to fail? Like, (laughs) you know, they need. Which is always a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) So, so what happens when you remove those federal funds and they can't charge these exorbitant tuitions? You know, things Mm -hmm. collapse, departments shrink, and you know people get laid off and. And so, yeah, so basically it's, the idea is not to go to college university. Like, like I, the, the way I see it, you know, I, I, um, I try to persuade people, you know, you know, start a business, work somewhere that you want, whatever you want to work in, find a place to do a menial task in that job and work, your, work yourself up and learn, learn the trade of the business. And you don't, you know, you don't need a degree. You don't need any kind of permission. Like, just learn directly and use your skills and, you know, I mean – just do it the agorist way. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and that's the thing too, is I've, I've seen this in different um, studies and um, I think Joel, Joel Salatin has said this because he homeschooled his children. Uh, homeschooled children tend to become entrepreneurs at the age of 14 mm-hmm. around that age. Right. Um, they start to become old enough to understand transactions and money and, and working and creating and doing things. And, um, you know, if my children become entrepreneurs, that would be the best thing <laughs> I think, you know, and if they want to yeah. do something else, awesome. I'll encourage them. But, uh, to be an entrepreneur, um, you know, you don't have to go to school for that, you know, essentially like you can just, you know, create a product or, you know, I mean, and I always think about, you know, like the Wright brothers, you know, they didn't have a pilot's license one. So <laughs> they didn't need the government to like help them with aviation. And they also, they didn't need, they didn't go to school for aviation. Right. But then what did they do? You know? So it's like the world's the, the our children's oyster, essentially, like they really could do anything. And, it, and if we, if they've got parents like us behind them, uh, to encourage that and, and, and help them to grow with that, you know, how amazing is their generation going to be, you know, if there's more parents like us, voluntarists, anarchists, peaceful parents, you know, how, you know, how nurtured and um, supportive um, are these kids growing up and that th- then they can turn around and create something, you know, instead of following orders, you know, essentially. So, well, of course, of course. I mean, um, you know, that's one of the reasons, um, you know, you, you're talking about 
um, you know, homeschooling parents being uh, young entrepreneurs. That's one of the reasons why I hesitate to look far into the future and think, you know, what are we going to do if they want to go to college? Because that is so far and there are so many things that can happen from here until yep. then that that's such a ridiculous thing to worry about. Absolutely. Like, it's such a ridic- like I, I mean, my, my wife like worries about things like that. I'm like, why are you even worried about this? <laughs> they're going to be fine. Like they're learning. That, I mean, what's more important than them being happy right now, being autonomous, independent, and learning on their own, you know, they're going to do, they're going to make it, whatever they do, they're going to, they, they have no, um, they have no barriers, you know, like, like we, um, in the childhoods that, that you and I experienced, we had many more barriers to overcome to become, mm-hmm. because we couldn't do the things that we wanted to do because we right. had to do things everyone else wanted us to do. Right. <laughs> so I'm not worried one bit about their future. Absolutely. <laughs> because because right, I think when, exactly. when, when kids are left in freedom to do and pursue and learn the things they want, success is the only option. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, and that makes sense, you know, and all the more reason to respect them and treat them as humans, you know, and not as your property, essentially. Yes. Respect their decisions, re- respect how they want to have their body, you know, and, and teach them basic morality. You know, we'll, we'll discuss more about morality in, in uh, another episode. But, um, but yeah, so this is, you know, the importance of self-ownership and, um, and it, that's where it starts, you know, it starts right, with, absolutely. it starts with taking responsibility for your actions, understanding the consequences of your, rea- your, uh, your actions. And, and just like your daughter, you know, she, now she learns how fast the hair is going to grow. Right. So, uh, yeah, so it's a great learning experience. Um, is there any, any final words you want to finish up with before we, uh, wrap up? I don't think so. <laughs> A- a- um, anyone who's saying what what why do i have to respect my daughter she she's only two she's only three what does she know about the world she has to learn it from me what would you say to somebody like that <laughs> what are you teaching her if you're not teaching her that she that you respect her if you don't respect her then she's going to learn that no one respects her right. because especially as parents you know where their go to guides in life and they should be getting their source of love and instruction from home and if they're not respected by you, then they can be easily taken advantage of by anyone else out there in the world and uh, make really bad decisions. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I heard, um, I don't know if you told me this or somebody else told me, um, that um, raising a child peacefully uh, um, and being a parent, you know, being an authority, but but not like coming from a position of power, just like just like explain things to them because you have more knowledge, right? And you want them to have the knowledge. So it's kind of like you being in a foreign country where you don't speak the language, you're not familiar with the customs, and you have a guide. And the guide leads you around and explains things to you. Right. Um, and he's not talking down to you. He's not superior. He just knows more about that particular area. So he's trying to right. help you. And so right. I think that's a great analogy for what um, what peaceful parenting means to me. Um, right. We're trying to guide our children um, to becoming fully autonomous um, human beings. So. Right, absolutely. So awesome. Uh, first episode of the uh, Non-Aggressive Parenting Podcast. Um, I'm very excited about this. We're going to be doing a lot more subjects and topics about everyday life of a radical, revolutionary, peaceful parent. Um, <laughs> and ma- maybe even we can start a Patreon, um, accept some donations for this. Uh, I think that would be great. Maybe uh, maybe some kind of PayPal. We got to figure that out. But probably definitely a Bitcoin, because um, um, you know we we all need help. We all need uh, monetary compensation for all the hard work and effort we put into this activism. Um, we're trying to make the world a better place. It's not easy. It's not uh, it's not free. Although it, it is free to consume this, but it was uh, it was done. Um, with opportunity cost, right? We had to Absolutely. choose this over other people. She had to get a babysitter. She's already she's already paying right there. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always cost to everything you do. So um, if anyone wants to help us out, please feel free to do so. Um, we will set something up. Um, hopefully, perhaps by the time this airs, we will. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, wonderful conversation, uh, Melissa. So we will see everyone in the next episode. Um, So this is Danilo and Melissa um, from the Non-Aggressive Parenting Podcast. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. 
If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video, or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods... If you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.